over the past couple of years, I've been working on this idea of uh, uh, the globalization of China's development finance, uh, particularly in the energy sector. I started uh, off with a, a look into uh, Chinese official development finance for the oil and gas sector, and then I moved on to the coal fire power sector, the renewable power sector, and now I'm looking at uh, the Chinese development finance for hydropower around the world. Um, as a result of this, this work, um, I and my, my collaborators have published a number of papers on, on this particular theme. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, uh, the, the one I just published or the one actually that's in the pipeline that will be out pretty soon uh, with uh, energy policy. The idea is that we wanted to look into uh, the reasons why China has emerged to become the largest player in um, development finance for infrastructure projects, particularly in the energy sector, just give just to take coal fire power, for example, uh, since uh, 2001, particularly after the, uh, the 2007, 2008 global financial crisis, China has uh, by far uh, provided about $51 billion of uh, official development finance for coal fire power around the world in 17 countries, totaling about 58 gigawatts of coal-fired power. This, of course, carries a lot of implications for climate uh, action around the world. And, and it's also um, intriguing because, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, internationally, there are growing concerns about climate change around the world. And, and uh, domestically, China is actually moving away from coal. So the question essentially is why is China doing this and what are the drivers and, uh, and what does this mean from the policy perspective, right? So we, we looked into the, the data, we collected our own data uh, of uh, uh, Chinese official development finance for coal-fired power around the world. Uh, and then we adopted a framework of sort of a push and a pull looking at the the external pull factors and, uh, and domestic push factors from China. And we basically concluded that, you know, um, if, you look at this, if you look at the story and, and uh, it's clear that uh, host governments and particularly the, the 17 uh, countries that have turned to China for coal develop, development finance, including actually Turkey, uh, seven, 16 now OECD countries and one OECD country, which is Turkey that have turned to China for help, largely because of uh, uh, three reasons. And one, uh, just a lot of past dependence. I mean, these three reasons basically speak to the entrenchment or entrenched preference for coal-fired power, uh, which is surprisingly not driven by economic growth, growth actually. Um, and the, the demand for coal-fired power to, to a large extent is a derivative of the there's three things. One, it's just the you know the resource availability or the availability of coal is a big factor actually, and that explains why some now you see countries have built a lot of coal over the past couple of years. And the second factor actually is past dependency, particularly in terms of infrastructure uh, locking and vested interests that thrive upon um, the continued use of coal in, the eco in those economies. And thirdly, energy security concerns um, uh, are also another reason why um, these, these, these countries have turned to China. Of course, they turned to China because China, of course, uh, is, um, uh, you know, of course, is the largest user of coal and coal technologies. As a result, um, Chinese firms, uh, you know, uh, are the, some of the most competitive contract contractors in the in the coal-fired uh, in development of coal-fired power plants and then the Chinese policy banks of course have deep pockets and so the, this term to China for development finance for coal-fired power technologies makes a lot of sense from the for these developed for these countries right and then from China's perspective uh, coal has encountered this shrinking development space because of a slowly you know growing economy and, and because of uh, you know, efficiency improvement, energy efficiency improvement and the squeeze uh, by renewables. 
and uh, also this, uh, this war on pollution. And, and another reason is that uh, there's a lot of excess capacity, particularly on the manufacturing side. Uh, as a result, you know, there's a lot of pressure for the industry, for the coal-fired power industry, particularly coal-fired manufacturers to go out. And, and since 2001, the Chinese government has launched this going out strategy. Initially, the coal-fired industry uh, went out essentially on its own, but since 2007, 2008, um, after the, the manufacturing excess capacity became a huge problem, the Chinese government started to, uh, to frame the issue as a national priority and under the, the, the banner of Belt and Road or international cooperation in the area of uh, productive capacity. And, and as a result, um, you know, there is this domestic push. So what this means is that for, the, for, the, for, for China's coal finance to reduce, two things have to happen and, and, and uh, you know, changes have to occur in both developing countries that have turned to China. And uh, also changes have to happen uh, in China and the Chinese government really has to um, send the signal to its policy banks that uh, um, uh, they should not finance coal at a time when the concerns about climate change are, are growing and when China is moving away from coal. And of course, uh, I think, uh, you know, recently there has been some interesting news about China essentially uh, moving away from coal in Bangladesh. And that may offer some hope about China's role in promoting sustainable development finance around the world. And so that sort of gives, um, leads me to this, this new project I'm, I'm thinking about that is China's role in, in, sustainable, development, uh, in, in sustainable power finance in the global south. Uh, so these are the projects I've been working on. And then in terms of uh, the projects I'm thinking about uh, in collaboration with the multipolarity group, uh, I think uh, a couple of things. One is this idea of uh, uh, this clash between the commercial logic and, and the geopolitical logic, particularly over the past couple of years. This, this clash has become very clear in the United States when, when President Trump was around. Um, the Trump administration really pushed American companies to come back home to reshore their activities uh, at home. And the Japanese government essentially did the same thing by setting aside financial incentives uh, for Japanese companies to go back home, to come back home. And, and so, uh, you know, um, this raises a question as to whether uh, businesses respond to pressure, political pressures, uh, and if so, how. And, and meanwhile, you know, uh, I think one can also test and see if the Chinese companies behave differently from American companies. So that is a, a project I'm interested to uh, work with the multipolarity group. And, um, and then there's another a big sort of a question I'm working on. And, and uh, certainly I, I would like to explore ways to collaborate with the multipolarity group as well. That is, uh, we will soon, uh, starting from this uh, this fall, we'll have a postdoc that will be working on um, the effort to really understand China's uh, influence in the world. Um, the the uh, the the idea is that we wanted to uh, conceptualize and, and quantify, and then um, how to measure uh, influence, and then draw the distinction between influence, power, and presence.